Hello and welcome everybody. Good day to you all from wherever you're tuning in. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all around uh, for today's webinar. Uh, today we'll be treating the Funios sensor card or box uh, because uh, we have uh, the card version and the box version. So we will be treating the Funios uh, sensor card today. And uh, to do this, uh, we have our team for today um, from South Africa, the TSA, Mohamed Sidat, who is from uh, our subsidiary in South Africa, that's Funios South Africa. And then uh, myself, Cipra Nukolo, uh, the TSA for Western Africa. And then of course, my colleague, uh, David Mwangi, who is the technical sales advisor at CSA for Eastern Africa. So together we will be presenting this topic for you today. And um, quickly we shall go through the agenda. Uh, first of all, we'll give you a background uh, view of uh, the sensor card. Then we'll treat uh, SolarNet, the, have an overview of the sensor card, uh, both the card version and the box version. We'll uh, go through the sensors overview, uh, have some online visualizations, uh, look at terminal overview, uh, look at solar service, commissioning, and then of course we'll give you um, uh, information uh, in case you're seeking much more or further information with regards to the topic uh, that we've treated, that is the solar card, solar sensor card. And then afterwards we'll be having a few, uh, a brief session of questions and answers. So believing that by the end of uh, the day or by the end of the presentation, we'll be absolutely sure that uh, you have got all the information you need about the Fronius sensor card. So today I will be uh, on a chat support. Uh, this presentation will be done by David Mwangi and Mohamed Sidat. So now I'm going to hand over uh, the control to David Mwangi, who is now going to take over and then continue with the presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, Cyprian, for the introduction. Um, I will be taking you through the first part of this webinar, uh, the Tronia sensor box or sensor card webinar. And to begin with, I would like us to look at some background on why we need uh, a sensor box in a system or an, in a PV installation. I think without a doubt, we can all agree that um, the performance and reliability of a PV system or a PV installation are critical aspects of uh, that system because this will uh, eventually ensure safety of energy supply as well as a faster return on your investment. Um, therefore, the performance ratio uh, for the system or for the installation needs to be monitored. This is especially important for commercial PV installations. Um, so the PR uh, or the performance ratio refers to the ratio in percentage of the actual energy delivered by the system over or versus the theoretically calculated energy that is deliverable from that system. These two uh, aspects or the actual versus the theoretical energy in the system have variations and these variations come as a result of uh, ambient conditions and parameters that affect overall system performance. Um, these parameters uh, range from uh, temperature, um, I can just quickly change my pointer here, Yeah, so from these parameters ranging from uh, ambient temperature, uh, wind velocity or the wind speed, as well as the irradiation that is uh, falling on the particular site where the system is installed. Um, of course, Fronius offers uh, a very cost effective uh, solution for obtaining these ambient uh, conditions parameters or data as well as analysis of the same. Um, 
For this, then, we need to understand the concept behind the sensor box, the data manager, as well as the monitoring platform, that is uh, SolarWeb. Um, PL calculations uh, would actually eventually, after a period of monitoring, reveal if there are correction measures that should be taken to address any shortcomings. So if the performance ratio falls too far below the expected average ratio, then that is a clear indication that something needs to be done to correct the situation. And of course, uh, the PR uh, or the performance ratio is something that you need to observe over a period of time to be able to understand how your system is working. To be able to understand further regarding the solar sensor card uh, or the sensor box, we also need to understand uh, the communication loop that the sensor box is using to transmit the data through the system. And for this, uh, we start at uh, looking at uh, the SolarNet, Solar.net, the Fronius Solar.net. And to understand Fronius Solar.net, um, we need to be familiar with how to configure the data manager. Of course, the data manager is a critical component for overall system uh, monitoring because the data manager will eventually set all the performance uh, data from the system. That includes uh, production, consumption, and all that. When you have a meter, then you can view also consumption data, as well as the data that is coming from the sensor box will pass through the data manager because the sensor box is not able to send data directly to SolarWeb. It's not a web server itself. So after that, we of course know that the data from the data manager is going through either a Wi-Fi network or a LAN network over internet into the solar web for monitoring. And this is the platform that will be able to show you the exact data that is coming out of your system. And this data will also include state codes. So if the inverter or the system itself, other than the ambient conditions, is encountering other uh, fault conditions, then you're also going to be able to see these state codes in solar web. To be able to monitor or to visualize this data, of course, you will require a gadget that has uh, internet capability. And this includes uh, smart watches, a smartphone, a tablet, or just the typical laptop. Um, going further, let's now look at uh, the Fronius Data Manager to understand it uh, more. Um, the Fronius Data Manager, in essence, is a plugin card. Uh, this is the data logger, is also the web server, is the Wi-Fi card, and also the access point, the wireless access point for the inverter. Um, just for your information, you can order two variations of Fronius Snap Inverters at the moment. You can order a light version, and the light version basically means that the inverter does not have the data manager card inbuilt, or you can order what you call the WLAN version that has the data manager card integrated. As far as monitoring is concerned, uh, ideally or theoretically, one data manager can handle up to 100 uh, snap inverters. But for streamlining uh, data communication and to improve on the latency of data communication, we recommend that this number is kept to the minimum possible, probably in the region of 20 inverters per data manager. Of course, as I mentioned before, the data manager is then sending all the system data collected uh, in intervals of about five minutes to SolarWeb. Uh, this is the, for, the basis for now monitoring. And this data is also available for monitoring through the online Fronius Solar TV. In terms of um, interfaces that allow the data manager to really work, we have quite a number of them. Uh, we have the Modbus TCP or Ethernet, uh, as well as the RTU, which is the connection with a three-wired connection between devices. We also have the Fronius API. This is the Fronius communication uh, protocol for between comp uh, Fronius components, and as well as a connection for the meter. And this is done, the smart meter, Fronius smart meter. This is done through the Fronius uh, RS485 uh, uh, terminal, and this is uh, uh, basically for getting data on consumption, like I said before, 
once you integrate the Fronius smart meter, then you can see uh, consumption data as well. And uh, yeah, the data manager card also has uh, ports for managing uh, energy. Uh, so depending on the thresholds that you have set in your system, you are able to probably switch on or off some loads depending on the amount of excess energy available in the system. So a further look, a uh, closer look at the inf interfaces. So I think for today's session, uh, what is important to understand as far as the sensor card is concerned is a communication loop that is on number one and two. And this is the solar net in and out. So uh, this is the protocol, like I said before, this is a CAT5 uh, protocol, requires a CAT5 cable. And this allows the daisy chaining of different uh, uh, Fronius components. Uh, like I said before, you can connect up to uh, 20 inverters to one data manager and up to 10 sensor cards or sensor boxes to one data manager, as we are going to see later. Um, the USB interface in this case is either for up, up, upgrading the software of the data manager or the inverter itself. And of course, there are other uh, terminals like the digital IOs that you can use for controlling external loads depending on availability of uh, energy in the system on thresholds uh, programmed. Um, going further, let's look at the Fronius uh, solar dot netring uh, to be able to understand what this is. Um, so, this uh, solar net ring is available for all Fronius inverters, except the Simo hybrid, because the Simo hybrid, in essence, is an inverter designed to work on its own, uh, although it's also capable of AC coupling. But when it starts uh, or it goes into backup mode using the batteries, then it shuts off other inverters. And therefore, even at that point, by frequency, uh, having other inverters in the system does not help much. Um, so the topology requires uh, the connection in and out with using the RJ45 with a CAT5 cable. And uh, of course, termination plugs are necessary. We have two examples here that we can discuss. As I had mentioned before, we can see from the snap inverter here, the light version, we have two other inverters that are also without a data manager card integrated. And therefore we have an external data manager box. The termination plugs can be seen that on the first gadget, on the first, the first inverter, and in the last uh, component, which is the data manager, we have the uh, termination plugs installed. So these are important because they signal the end of the communication loop and therefore there is smooth data flow between the various components. Another va variation would be when you have an inverter with an integrated data manager, or what we call the WLAN version. And in this case also, you still need to uh, terminate the first uh, gadget and the last gadget as well here. And the last gadget also needs to be terminated. So the CAT5 cable is coming from the out uh, terminal of one inverter into the in of the next uh, gadget. Um, let's now have a look at the sensor card or the sensor box itself to get an overview and to familiarize ourselves with uh, this gadget. So um, the sensor box is something like this as seen here. And of course, if you have this uh, sensor card, then this is something that you plug in into the inverter and this is connecting to the data manager and uh, the reservoir or the display or the, of the inverter. The sensor box or the sensor card will allow the connection of different types of uh, sensors. Um, we have several types of sensors that are supplied by, by Fronius which you are going to be looking at uh, in, an, in the next few slides. Um, then the sensor box or the sensor card is transmitting data after calculating the data and interpreting it to the data manager 
And of course, the data manager now forwards this data to SolarWeb for monitoring. As I mentioned before, um, up to 10 sensor boxes can be used in one system. Uh, it depends on what exactly has to be analyzed. So in most cases, uh, uh, one data box is usually enough, but that will depend on your actual design because the sensor box is not limited to only monitoring, let's say, the radiation or temperature or uh, wind speed. There are many other uh, types of data from sensors that the sensor box is able to get. And my colleague, uh, Mohammed is, is going to be speaking about that much later. Um, the only thing I can mention here is this choice between either the sensor card of the or the sensor box version it depends on the actual installation uh, area. That is the distance that will be between uh, the sensors and the data manager or the first inverter with the data manager itself. So if uh, the inverter is installed or mounted just below the panels, uh, because there could be a limitation with the length of the sensor cables uh, available, then it might be possible for you to connect uh, or to have a plug-in card, a uh, sensor card in the inverter. If, however, the installation is uh, roof mounted, the PV system is roof mounted, and the, the snap inverter is uh, a bit of a distance from the solar panels, then you might consider using the Fronia sensor box to have it as close as possible to uh, the sensors themselves, because the connection between the sensor box and the data manager is through the CAT5 cable, and this CAT5 cable can run up to a distance of about uh, 100 meters, so uh, that does not limit it as much as the sensor uh, 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 cables can. Um, a much further or detailed uh, look at the data box, the specifications. Um, the data box or the sensor card itself uh, requires a DC voltage of about 12 volts. And this voltage is carried over the CAT5 cable. In terms of energy consumption, we are looking at just about 1.3 watts. It's an IP20 gadget, so this means uh, the choice of installation area has to be protected from elements such as uh, direct splashing or direct uh, heat, so that uh, you can you get the best out of this uh, gadget. Of course, um, like I said before. There are possibilities. There is a possibility to, con to connect different types of sensors. Uh, one of them is the PT1000. Uh, this is a temperature sensor, and for most applications, PV installations, we are monitoring two aspects of temperature. One is the ambient temperature, and the next one is the module temperature. We are going to look at how these uh, sensors look like and the principle behind how they operate. Uh, the next kind of sensor that we can connect is the irradiation sensor or what is connected through the insulation channel. And this can measure within three classes of uh, voltage from 0 to 100 millivolts up to 200 millivolts, then to 1 volt. Um, we could also connect uh, a weed speed sensor. And uh, this, of course, is looking at the weed speed in meters per second. And in a sh uh, short while, we are going to look at uh, also how this is happening. The interfaces available, as I said before, you can see them here, in and out. This is the solar net ring. So this is an RJ45 socket. So for typical CAT5 or CAT6 um, cable. So um, let's now have a look or an overview on the sensors themselves. So Fronius, uh, at Fronius, you can get uh, four basic sensors for monitoring uh, data relevant to your PV installation. Number one, you can get uh, a voltage sensitive uh, input or irradiation sensor, uh, which is this one here. Um, and basically, the principle behind this is that the sensor box is measuring the voltage difference between the two connections of the irradiation sensor. And the through uh, a conversion factor, then the sensor box is interpreting what this voltage means in terms of the available irradiation. 
Number two, we can have the PT100 uh, sensor for temperature. And um, the basic principle is that uh, the sensor itself has a resistor inside and the sensor box is interpreting the voltage drop when a constant current is passing through the resistors. And from this value of the voltage drop, then the sensor box is working out what is the uh, temperature at that particular moment. This, this one here is also a variation of the temperature sensor, and this one is for measuring the module temperature. And of course, we have uh, the weed gauge or the weed velocity uh, sensor. So the slight difference is that this is uh, looking at the pulses, and uh, the sensor box is working out what, how many pulses it's getting from the weed uh, uh, velocity sensor per second, and therefore translating this into meters per second to give you the actual speed of the wind uh, at that particular moment. So all these sensors are actually very cost effective and a very easy solution to use with the Fronius sensor box in conjunction with the data manager. Um, going on further, let's look at um, how this data appears in uh, a solar web when you want to visualize this data. So we have an example here of uh, our office in Italy, uh, the, the PV installation there. And this screenshot was taken on the 8th of April, uh, around uh, 7.40 in the morning. What we can see here is that uh, the ambient temperature and the module temperature are nearly the same at 15 degrees. And the simple explanation for this is because uh, this early in the morning, the sun was not very hot, and therefore the cell temperature uh, was considerably lower because they, were, they are not generating too much at this point. As we can see here, the, the insulation level also is uh, not very high. If you follow this curve just about this point, we have about around 7.40 in the morning, 193 watt per meter squared. So this is quite on the lower side and explains also the temperature of the solar panel at this point. So um, in terms of the usefulness of this data, um, like you, I had mentioned before, it's not just a question of obtaining what is the temperature, the ambient temperature, what is the cell temperature. This data can actually be quite useful because over a period of time when you have monitored your system, you should be able to work out what is the PR or the performance ratio. As I said before, the PR will be a comparison between what is the actual delivered energy and the actual delivered energy will be communicated also to CellWeb through the data manager from the inverter and what is the theoretical uh, possible energy output from this system. So when you want now to calculate your theoretical possible energy output, you have to consider your irradiation or the average irradiation of a period of time. And typically the best period to evaluate this is over a period of one year so that you have all the variations that could happen with that irradiation, including shedding and so forth, accounted for. Uh, additionally, you have to look at what is the efficiency of your cell uh, or solar panels, the one that you have used for the installation. And this is uh, very easy to get because this is uh, printed on the back plate of the solar panels. So this is uh, data that you can uh, readily, readily get. And of course, once you have understood that, then you have to consider what is the effective PV installation area. That, that is the area converting this irradiation into actual usable energy. And if those uh, uh, three factors or vari variants, then you can calculate what is your theoretically possible energy output from the system. Then looking at what was uh, produced by the system itself uh, from the solar web through the data manager data, then you can work out what is your performance ratio. If your performance ratio is below, let's say 80%, that would be an indication that uh, your system has something that needs to be checked. This below average uh, PR or performance ratios can be as a result of dust on the panels. That means over a period of time, this needs to be cleaned up. It could be as a result of shedding, maybe a new building or a, a new tree has cropped up with, with, within the vicinity of the installation needs to be taken care of. 
It could be an indication also of uh, faulty components or more than uh, acceptable uh, voltage drop or power losses in the cables. And therefore, this is something that needs to be addressed as well. Um, one further example to show you how this data from the sensor box is coming into SolarWeb. We are comparing uh, the ambient temperature that is shown by the blue line here and the module temperature by shown by the green line here. And this is data also from the same system in Italy was taken on the 7th of April this year. So what we can see here is um, just about when the sun is starting to shine, the module temperature as shown before and the ambient temperature are nearly the same. But as the irradiation increases, we follow this green curve, then the module temperature is uh, significantly increasing and it's peaking at around maybe mid between uh, 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. thereabout. That is when you have the highest temperature of about 45 on the module uh, or the cells themselves. And as the sun goes down, there's no production uh, from around maybe 5.30 or thereabout. And therefore, the module temperature is falling uh, below um, uh, uh, the ambient temperature, sort of. So, um, I think I've come to the end of my session, and at this point, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Mo. Um, Okay, so hey, thank you very much, David. Yeah, for your very informative um, session. Okay. Okay, I'll now be taking over from um, talking about the terminal overview. Okay, so what I have um, on the screen at the moment is a basic diagram of the terminal overview of a Fronius sensor box or sensor card. And they both have the exact same terminals. Um, with this example over here, we have eight terminals and each terminal has a specific use. So for example, terminal one, that's your power supply and it gives out a five volt power supply, okay? Um, so your sensors do not need their own power supply. They will get their power supply from the sensor box. Okay, the second channel is going to be your digital input um, channel. Your third channel is also going to be your digital input channel. Your fourth channel will then be the ground um, for your digital channels. Okay, um, your fifth channel, um, which is this one over here, will now be the analog input, and this will be for a current signal. Okay, the next port will be the ground for your analog inputs. Port six will now be your PT1000 um, temperature sensor inputs, as well as port seven. Um, so port six and port seven are what we can consider as interchangeable ports. It doesn't matter which one you do use for your temperature sensor. Port eight is gonna be for your irradiation sensor, and that is obviously to determine the strength of the um, irradiation that's coming through. Okay, it's very important to note um, that port 8 is dedicated for an irradiation sensor. Port 6 and 7 is also dedicated for a temperature sensor, so you can't use port 6 to port 8 for any other uses than what it is specified um, on this presentation. Port 5 is a freely configurable um, port. You can choose to use different types of analog um, sensors. And just to note that um, within port five, we do have a ADC, which is an analog to digital converter. Um, so it will accept an analog signal and it will convert that into a respective digital signal, which our um, system can then interpret, interpret and give you a result. Okay, and then port one to port four is dedicated for a digital signal. Um, these digital signals can um, differ according to your use. So if you do want to use a wind sensor, you can use wind sensors. If you want to connect a power meter, you can connect a power meter. Or even if you want to um, connect a 
a level meter, maybe to determine the um, level of diesel in the generator. Um, you can also use a one of these diesel, um, sorry, um, one of these digital um, channels for that. Okay, um, so yeah, just to just to recap, um, port one to port four. Um, these are, as I said um, earlier, these are your digital inputs. Um, port five is going to be your analog inputs, which will be a current inputs. Um, port six and port seven will now be your um, temperature inputs, your dedicated temperature inputs, and port eight will be your irradiation um, inputs. Okay, and just remember between port six to port eight, um, these are dedicated input so they can't be used for anything other than what they um, are presented to be used in this presentation. Um, again you can use port 1 and port 4 for any digital inputs and you can use port 5 for any analog inputs. Okay just to go into more um, depth on the digital inputs. Um, for the digital inputs uh, we have channel 1 which is your um, power supply, 5 volt power supply. Um, channel 4 is your ground, and channel 2 and 3 is for your um, two different digital inputs. Okay, so in this case scenario, um, on channel 3, I connected a wind sensor. Okay, and on channel 2, I connected a power meter. Okay, um, just remember with a sensor such as a wind sensor, um, it makes a lot of sense um, to put this onto the digital port um, because most wind, wind sensors out there um, produce a digital signal, which is basically a, a discrete digital output. So it will either produce a binary one or a binary zero, um, depending on the speed at which it's rotating. And obviously, um, the faster it rotates, the more um, binary bits um, of one that it produces. Okay, our system will then count up these bits, and it will then do the conversion factor in order to indicate the actual wind speed um, that is occurring. Okay, um, a similar use can be set for a electricity meter. Ele an electricity meter can also be connected across port one and port two. And as your kilowatt hours increase through the meter, um, the more binary um, one bits will be produced. And in turn, um, our sensor box can then interpret, use the appropriate conversion factor, and then give you the appropriate kilowatts hour um, inputs that it reads. Moving on to the analog inputs, um, in this case scenario, I have connected a humidity sensor um, as the analog input. Um, just remember with an analog input, it produces a continuous output um, that will vary um, between zero to 20 milliamps, depending on um, the strength of the stimuli. Okay, so in, in this case scenario, it is a humidity sensor. So when the humidity increases, um, the sensor will produce a greater current, um, which will then be sent um, to the analog inputs. Our sensor card then has an integrated ADC, which is an analog to digital converter. It will then convert um, the current um, to a digital um, signal, which our sensor card can now um, understand and interpret. Moving on to the temperature inputs, these are going to be dedicated on port 6 and port 7 of the sensor card. Just remember with the temperature inputs, um, you have to use a PT1000 temperature sensor, so that's non-negotiable. Um, basically, what is a PT1000 temperature sensor? PT stands for a platinum, and the 1000 stands for um, the, the measurement basic, which basically states that at zero degrees Celsius, the PT1000 temperature sensor has a resistance of 1000 ohms. Okay, so obviously as your temperature will increase, um, the 1000 ohm value will also increase. And in turn, um, our sensor card can then read um, the scale in which the resistance has increased and then determine the appropriate temperature um, of the modules or of the ambient temperature. And just remember for the PT1000 um, temperature sensor inputs, it's very sensible to have one port for the ambient temperature and one port for the 
for the module temperature. Um, as you know, your module temperature will most likely um, differ from your um, ambient temperature. And um, what, what we can say is during um, maximum solar irradiation, let's say at 12 o'clock in the day, um, your module temperature will most likely be twice the temperature of your ambient temperature. Okay, this is only at maximum um, solar irradiation levels. And again, this is very important in order to determine whether your system is actually um, producing enough power as to what um, is coming from the sun. The next part I'll be talking about is your um, digital input ports, and this will be indicated by the, um, the strength of the voltage signal, and this will obviously be indicated in the form of a binary bit, um, either a binary bit of one or zero. Um, the more ones that are produced, um, the higher the strength of that signal will be. And our sensor card will then interpret it as such. Okay, and just to, um, just to correct on the fact um, with the irradiation sensor, um, this is a dedicated irradiation sensor port, um, which does give you an output in watts per meter squared. And just the principle that this works in is it measures the voltage difference between um, the positive port and the negative port. Uh, measuring the voltage difference, it takes that difference and then sends it to our um, sensor card, which is already programmed um, to interpret the difference as a logical watts per meter squared output. Okay, I'll now be moving on to the solar.service program. So this is a very important program in order to set up and commission your Fronius sensor card. The solar.service program can be downloaded from our webpage. Um, one of my colleagues will be sharing you the link in the chat. Um, if you don't get the link now, the link will also be shared later on during the presentation. Um, basically, with the solar.service um, program, you basically download it onto your laptop. And it allows you to do extremely quick diagnosis um, of a Fronius PV system. Just remember, if you are going to use SolarWeb um, to do on-site diagnostics, um, there will always be a sort of two-minute delay um, between the actual reading and the readings that you are seeing on SolarWeb. Because remember, the data from SolarWeb gets sent to our servers in Austria, and then from our servers in Austria, it then has to get sent back to the client. So all that process can take about two minutes. That's why it's better to use solar.service for on-site um, analysis, configuration, and servicing. And this is because you can get real-time values of the PV system. So if the PV system is producing 10,000 watts at an instance in time, you will get 10,000 watts indicated on the solar.service program without any delays. Okay, you'll also need the solar.service program in order to set up um, the Fronia sense card and commission it. And I will be um, showing you how to do that um, later on in the presentation. Okay, just to um, have a look at other advantages of the solar.service program, uh, you get a very good transparent listing of any status codes on the inverter. And it also allows you to um, do some inverter functions to set it up as well. Um, it also saves you time and money. Um, and this is because um, you can get a lot of fronious information from your PV system all on one view at one time, okay? It's also very convenient. Um, it can be downloaded free of charge and um, it works extremely well on site. And it's again, extremely efficient. And this is because component faults can be identified and rectified more quickly. And again, the result will then mean that you will have shorter downtimes and um, higher yields. Just to show you a configuration diagram of the solar.service um, platform, you'll basically have your PV modules that are connected to your Fronius PV inverter. And in between that, you can either have a router, okay, or you can have an Ethernet connection between a laptop that's running Fronius solar.service, okay? So you can either connect an Ethernet cable between the laptop and the inverter to pick up the inverter, or you can use a router in order to pick up the IP address of the inverter. Um, the other method is you can also switch on the Wi-Fi access point of the inverter and access the inverter directly without any need of a network. 
whether it's a wireless network or a wired LAN network. Okay, I will now be moving on to commissioning. What's very important to note is um, the first step of the comm commissioning process, and this starts off with correctly connecting our Fronius inverters to the sensor box. Okay, so the connection between the sensor box and the Fronius inverters happens by a Cat5 connection. Okay, um, and please use Cat5 cables. Do not use Cat6 cables. If you are going to use Cat6 cables, um, this communication protocol will not work, and you will get um, some errors in communication. What's very important to note is you have to place an RJ45 plug in the first Fronius piece of hardware and in the last Fronius piece of hardware. So in the in and the out, there has to be an RJ45 plug. This sensor box can go anywhere in this um, solo.net loop. So it doesn't have to be um, the second last item or the last item. It can be in the front, it can be in the middle, it can be anywhere within the loop. It can be at the beginning of the loop, it can be at the end of the loop, it just has to be somewhere in the loop. Whatever information is connected from the sensors, um, the sensor box will then collect that information and it will then send that information via the solar net connection to the master inverter. So in this scenario, it will send out all the information um, along the loop until it gets to the master inverter. The master inverter has a data manager installed and this master inverter will now send all this information um, wirelessly um, to our solar.web platform, uh, where you can then um, monitor all these parameters remotely. Okay, once you have the physical layout um, set up, the next important step is to please um, switch on the Wi-Fi access point of the Fronius inverter. In order to do that, you have to go to the screen of the Fronius inverter. You have to scroll to Setup after which you have to go to Wi-Fi access points. You then have to click activate Wi-Fi access points. And once you click on activate Wi-Fi access points, um, you will then um, have the Fronius um, underscore data manager ID pop up, and you'll also have the password. Um, so that's gonna be your network name, and that's gonna be your password. Um, so you basically take your laptop, um, connect it to that specific network and enter the Enter the correct um, password, which will always be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I'm basically just indicating um, how to um, go about connecting to the Wi-Fi access point on your laptop. Um, again, you're just going to switch, go to your um, network connections. You're going to look for the Fronius underscore data manager ID, and you can then enter your password and click connect, and your laptop will then connect to the inverters network. Okay, once you've done that, you then need to open up the solar.service um, program. I told you earlier that I will be sharing the link um, of the solar.service program, and the link is here on the bottom of the screen. Um, you can download um, this program after the presentation. We will also be sharing the presentation with you, and in that presentation um, that we do share with you, we will also indicate the download link. Okay, as I said earlier, it's a free to use program. Um, you just download it onto your Windows PC. Um, you then start it up. Once you start it up, um, and once you've connected to the inverter Wi Fi access points, you then have to click on Add Connection over here. Once you've done that, the next screen will pop up. It will ask for a PV system name. Um, this PV system name can be any name, it's not a specific name. Okay, it can be literally any name you choose to name your PV system. What's very important is the IP address. Okay, if you are connecting to the inverter's Wi-Fi access point, um, the IP address will be 192.168.250.181. Okay, so that's the standard IP address of the Fronius Wi-Fi access point once you switch it on. Okay, so you're going to enter that IP address onto this program, and once you've done that, um, you can then click on Add. Okay, it's very important to note that this is the IP address of the data manager and it is not the IP address of the sensor card. Okay, um, that's a very important fact. The sensor card does not have an IP address in this case. Um, the only IP address is coming from the Fronius data manager. 
Okay, this is another reason why you cannot use the Phonius sensor card without the Phonius data manager. Okay, it is not possible. You have to use the Phonius sensor card in combination with the Phonius data manager. Okay, um, this is another reason why you cannot use the Phonius sensor card for third party um, uses. Maybe to use, maybe if you want to use the Phonius sensor card um, for some other purpose other than um, adding it onto a Phonius system. Okay, what you can do um, to transfer information from the sensor box to a third party platform is that you can query our solar web okay platform and you can do this using solar web query api okay if you do want access to this you just have to um, send us an email um, either to one of the technical sales advisors or you can even email tech support and we will allow you to query our solar web and um, extract um, your data and um, send it to a third-party platform if you do want to do it. Okay, anyways, once we have entered the IP address and we click for search, the program will search for that IP address. And once it finds it, it will appear over here. Okay. It will also appear at the bottom of the screen where you'll see that the sensor card will now pop up. As you can see in this system, we had a Fronia Simo 20 kilowatt running, okay? And as you can see, we have no, no error um, indicated on this inverter. Okay, we can also pick up the data manager as well on the solar.service program. And as you can see, everything is working fine um, on our data manager. The only problem we have over here is um, this data manager wasn't really connected to the internet. And that's why you can see um, the solar web is red. Okay, what you need to do is you need to look for the sensor card um, block. And if your sensor card is successfully found, it will pop up over here, okay? As you can see, we can see sensor card and we can also see the version of the sensor card. Okay, once it pops up, you just have to double click um, on the sensor card. And once you do that, you will then be brought to the next screen. Okay, on the next screen, this is now where the setup of the sensor card will now begin. So you just go to setup menu over here and once you click on setup menu you will then be brought to the screen over here okay as you see we have different columns um, on the screen we have the channels and this will indicate temperature one temperature two the irradiation channel your digital one digital two and your um, current analog channel we can also choose to activate these channels or deactivate them so let's say for example i I install two temperature sensors, I install an irradiation sensor, I install two digital input sensors, and I also install a analog current um, sensor. I will have to activate all of them, okay? And the next step is then to choose the correct unit. As I said earlier on, um, the temperature ports are dedicated for temperature sensors, and the only unit you can differ is degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's what you can choose between. Okay. The irradiation sensor, you cannot choose what unit you want to use. It is locked to watts per meter squared. Okay, so that you cannot change the unit. As I said earlier on, that specific channel is dedicated for an irradiation sensor, which will pick up the difference in voltage levels um, between port one and port two. Your digital one and your digital two input channels, um, those units can be configured and chosen. So if you choose to install a wind sensor on digital one, um, you will choose um, kilometers per hour, okay? Um, on digital two, if you choose to maybe install um, a sensor which measures the speed of a rotor in a generator, um, you will then choose a unit such as meters per second, okay? Which makes more sense to measure um, a rotor speed, either meters per second or revolutions per minute, because the conversion from meters to second to revolutions per minute um, is much more simpler than from kilometers per hour to RPM. Okay, um, the next one would be the current. Um, obviously, for the unit for the current, again, you have a wide um, range of units that you can select. So, for example, I'm showing you at the bottom of the screen here the applicable units that you can select. So, for example, you can select uh, meters cube, which, which might be very useful to determine your um, diesel level in a diesel generator. Or maybe um, you might choose to select Hertz, which might be important 
to determine the frequency of your AC mains. So again, as you can see with our, our sensor card, it's extremely configurable and um, the amount of uses that you can use it for is not really limited. Um, you can pretty much pull any sensor you can think of um, on the market. And as long as it satisfies one of the correct units, uh, measurement range, as well as calibration factor, you will be able to use that. Okay, the next column will be the measurement range. This is very important. Uh, the measurement range is only applicable for the irradiation channel and for the um, current channel. The reason for that is because with the, the analog current channel and with the irradiation channel, these channels pick up on the difference between port one and port two. Okay, so that's why it's very important to have a sort of measurement, measurement range for these two channels. Okay, for the irradiation channel, um, the first choice is 0 to 100 millivolts. You also have another option from 0 to 1 volt. Um, obviously, this is very dependent on um, the sensor you're using. Um, so please have a look at the nameplate of the sensor that you do use in order to determine the measurement range. The next column will be your calibration factor. Again, it's a very important column as well because this is what the sensor card will use in order to, to do the required calculation, in order to convert your binary to an appropriate output or to convert your digital um, or analog signals or voltage signals to an appropriate output that you can now interpret. Okay, these calibration factors can also be read on the nameplate of the sensor. Uh, for example, if you do purchase a Fronius irradiation sensor, um, the calibration factor will be 70.1 on the nameplate and the measurement range will be between 0 to 100 millivolts, as an example. That's all from my side. I'm now going to be handing over to um, Cyprian um, to do the um, final slides and also to start up the Q&A session. Um, before we move on to that, I just want to launch some polls. And uh, I really appreciate if everybody could just share the answer, um, but I'm going to be launching the first poll now. So the first question is, do you install sensors to a PV system? First option is, yes, you always do this. Um, second option is, yes, sometimes I do this. And third option is um, you never ever install um, sensors onto your PV installations. So as the result indicates, most of the attendees today um, sometimes um, install sensors to a PV system, um, which I kind of get um, why this is the most popular choice, because um, personally, it would not make sense to install um, sensors to a very small system, uh, but it makes a lot of sense to install sensors to a very big system, such as a commercial system. Okay, so that is probably why we have the responses um, as such. Okay, I'll now be launching um, one more poll, um, so I'll just appreciate if everybody could um, also please answer the next question. Do you have experience with the Fronius sensor card box? Um, so you can either select yes or no. So as you can see by the results, we have a lot of new um, installers out there who have not used the Fronia sensor um, card or box, and that's really good to, to um, you know to know that we um, getting new installers online so that we can um, adequately train 
um, to ensure that um, you have a seamless experience in using um, our Fronius sensor card. Okay, I would now like to hand over to um, my colleague, Supriya Nicolo, um, who will be doing the concluding slides of the presentation, and he will also be launching the Q&A session. Um, so please um, stay tuned for the Q&A session. Um, there'll be really some good questions that are usually asked from the audience um, that we will try and answer to our best ability. Hello, thanks a lot for uh, the presentation. Thanks a lot, David, too. Um, yes, we can all see that uh, this is a very interesting topic, uh, the Fronius uh, sensor card, and I want to believe that uh, you all enjoyed it. Uh, you enjoyed our content and the information that we had uh, to provide. So just in case you need more information, you can do well to go to our, our website and then go to our landing page at the Solar Energy. Uh, as you can see here, and then go to Info Center and then go to Installer Support. There you get a whole um, range of uh, information ranging from how to install uh, manuals and instructions, monitoring service. In fact, all the information you need, you can actually find them here. So, and uh, once you do that, um, of course, you will be equipped with all the information that you need. And uh, of course, you can also log into our YouTube channel and get uh, all the videos that uh, we normally launch on them. And um, yeah, so it's there for you all to um, make use of. And then of course, if you still have further information, you can as well contact our te technical team, training team, or after sales team. And then of course, you can also contact us directly, Mohamed Sidat, who is in the technical sales advisor for Southern Africa, myself, Cipro Nicolo, uh, the technical sales advisor of Western Africa, and then David Mwangi, the technical sales advisor for Eastern Africa.